welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, America's number one trusted resource for realtors who demand authentic, real-time coaching. Starring award-winning real estate coaches Tim and Julie Harris. Get ready for unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what is truly working to get you into action and make you money in this new real estate boom. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Welcome back to Real Estate Coaching Radio. This is the nation's number one radio show just for real estate practitioners. Oh, sure, there are other radio shows out there that um, folks in the real estate industry listen to. But this is the number one radio show where agents go and get information that is getting them to action and making the most of this new real estate boom. We have, and we are proud to say, over 100,000 regular listeners now, and we want to sincerely thank all of you, as we often do, for helping to make that um, a possibility and making that dream become a reality. So thank you for all of that, for all of you, for everything you've done um, to help spread the word about the radio show and help us, essentially, I think in many cases, illuminate the opportunity that this new market is. Julie, welcome to today's radio show. Thank you. It's a pleasure, as always, to be here. It's going to be an exciting uh, continuation show, and I've already had many of our uh, personal and our coaches' coaching clients uh, compliment and enjoy what this is a continuation of, the uh, discussion about profit. It's really made a lot of them stop and think and take some action to get implementing. So it's, it's caused some very interesting conversation, and I look forward to continuing that with today's show. So what we're talking about today and what we talked about on Monday was the, a great book called uh, Profits Aren't Everything, They're the Only Thing. Profits Aren't Everything, They're the Only Thing. Fantastic book that all of you should get immediately and read. And the best thing about the book the, what, is the fact that it really does cut through all the BS about sort of the myths and the mis, myth beliefs, misbeliefs that agents have, well, and business people in general have about how to run a business. There's so much Mickey Mouse and malarkey, so much confusing information out there that it's no wonder that there's so many agents that struggle in their real estate businesses. The biggest myth out there right now is that you have to have a big staff or a big team in order to basically make a lot of money. Well, I should correct that, in order to make profit, and that isn't true. And the reality, and we talked about this, and I know a lot of you guys have joined our coaching organization because of the fact that we were willing to tell you the truth about this, is the most profitable by a country mile, real estate practices, and that's what you guys have. You have a real estate practice, are the ones where it's typically one um, or two agents with maybe one or two assistants, and that's it. And those are the uh, practices that are uh, the you know the result in agents making fifty, sixty, seventy percent profit. And as a result of that, when they accept the fact that they pay themselves first, and we talked about that on the radio show on Monday, that they're able then to reinvest that money and make themselves wealthy. Some of you guys have been, um, I can tell by some of the emailed questions and some of the, uh, our coaches have been asking us about this. Uh, some of you guys are conflicted about the whole idea of profit and money. You're maybe in some ways culturally bent to believe that having money as a motivator, uh, as a motivator is somehow evil. And I'm here to tell you that's absolutely positively not true. The reality of it is, is if you have profit as your product, and that's a fun question we like to ask agents, you know, what is your product? And your product ultimately is profit, because without profit, you're out of business. If you are profit-minded, and if your every action is designed around making a profit, everything else follows that. So what do I mean? Well, you guys know that we're big advocates of the mindset of service. Um, you know, you definitely want to enter into this industry and, and, and you'll flourish in this industry with a mindset of service. When you're putting the other person's needs first, when you're in the real estate business, you will always win. Just a fact. And by the way, that's true with everything in life. Now, I'm not saying to hang yourself on the cross and I'm not saying, you know, sacrifice what's important to you. Nothing like that. What I'm saying is in a sales environment, when you are working with someone who's trying to solve a problem, maybe it's an unrepresented owner, you know, a for sale by owner, or, or it's an expired, or it's just anybody that's interested in buying or selling a home. They have a problem to solve, and if you're focusing all your best energies on being of service to them and helping them solve the problem, what that does is it makes you present in the moment, it makes you present with what matters most to them, and it makes it so that they will trust you quicker and that you'll able to do, you're able to do a, a job that's not going to be uh, you know, full of emotions and ego. The mindset of service is something that once you accept that you are here to serve and the highest and best use of all of us is to be of service to others, once you accept that, 
what happens then is you start creating more business. Now, if you just create business just for the sake of running transactions through and you aren't specifically focused on making profit, you will make yourself broke because you'll end up basically, well, either emotionally broke or financially broke. Our premise is that if you are focused on profit, in other words, you're focused on paying yourself first and some of the other things we're going to share with you on today's radio show, and we also talked about on Monday. If you're focused on that, everything else sorts itself out. In other words, if you don't have the profit margins that you want, um, then you're going to go and start making decisions that are going to be business-minded. In other words, you then realize, well, maybe the type of business that I'm taking and the, the fees that I'm paying to get that lead, maybe it doesn't make sense because I'm not making profit. Or you look at, and this is a common issue I have, and you know all of our coaches deal with this. Some of you guys come to us and you have these armies of buyer's agents. You have five, six, ten buyer's agents. And you went to some conference and you read some book, and a lot of you guys are Keller Williams agents that have this, and you've never actually done a profit and loss on the buyer side of your business. Or even better, you've never actually done a profit and loss on your individual buyer's agents. And what that really truly means is you don't know whether you're making a profit or a loss on the buyer's agents. And in most cases, it's not an easy conversation to really you know, peel back the layers of the onion and have you folks realize that buyer's agents usually are not a profit center. They're are you know, they're an expense. There's something that you might, in some cases, be better off that division, that sort of myth of having an army of buyer agents. In some cases, depending on your overall business structure, depending on your overall cost structure, and frankly, depending on your average sale price and your average commission, buyer's agents sometimes can actually create a loss in your business. So if you're struggling and you have a big team to understand why you are not building wealth faster on a personal level, that's one of the first things that we're going to look at, basically, is we're going to drill down on where all your expenses are. We're going to drill down on basically some of the decisions that you made in the past um, you know, using probably uh, information that wasn't designed around making you a profit, but maybe was designed around you just doing transactions. So, so that's the thing. Just because you know how to sell a lot of houses, and Julie and I learned this, you know, frankly, b uh, by uh, becoming Howard Britton stars. And we learned this from um, meetings, a lot of the other folks that were also Howard Britton stars. Some of these guys were selling, and God bless them all, so, you know, just keep that in mind. But some of them were selling uh, 1,000 homes a year. And you'd assumed immediately, because they were selling such huge volumes of real estate, and making, you know, in some cases, millions and millions of dollars a year in commissions. You'd assume these guys would just be, you know, rich, rolled in the cash. And then, usually after a glass of wine or two, they'd start telling you this, the truth, that basically their business is barely, uh, uh, you know, profitable, and they're running sometimes less than a 10% profit margin before taxes. In other words, they're paying themselves, you know, less than 10% of what the total revenue is, and the numbers just are not working in their favor, and they don't know what they did wrong. That is a very common problem in the real estate industry with teams. The, per the person taking the risk, the team leader, is not building wealth. Yes, they're doing transactions. Yes, they're making lots of commissions. Yes, they're getting the awards. Yes, they're going to the banquets. Yes, they're getting all the attention. And yes, everyone thinks they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. But when they're at home and they're you know, sitting there looking at their numbers, they're beating their heads against the wall because in many cases they don't understand why they're not accumulating more wealth, which is the whole point. Because once you make profit, then you can reinvest that money and you can become rich. And our definition of rich is where your money works for you and you no longer have to work for your money. So Julie, where did we leave this off um, in our notes on Monday? Yes, yeah, so just a reminder, the book that we're, refer <clears throat> excuse me, that we're referring to is called Profits Aren't Everything, They're the Only Thing, and the author's name is George Cloutier, which is C-L-O-U-T-I-E-R, available on Amazon as a book or audio book. So if you have not yet invested in that, that's your homework from today's radio show. So we, again, started this uh, a couple of days ago, so make sure you caught that radio show. And in the meantime, let's continue this. We had been talking, Tim, about uh, small business owners should be fanatical about living a profits first plan. So what does an agent do with that? I mean, how do you actually apply that? So I wrote down some questions for our listeners. The first one we touched on a little bit on the previous radio show, how do you pay yourself? Are you leading with revenue or leading with expense? Well, one of the easiest ways to tell is are you actually taking some profit off the top before you pay everyone else? 
or are you using the typical, ordinary, starving, broke, living check-to-check agent lifestyle of saying, well, I'll just save what's left over at the end, if anything's uh, left over at the end. That's not really profit, that's luck. You take profit off the top. So again, how do they actually implement these ideas, Tim? Well, pay yourself first. We talked about that. And then you started to talk a second ago about the next question I wrote down, how do you pay your buyer's agents? And this is kind of an interesting can of worms, I think, Tim, because a lot of agents, especially, I have to say, on the top producing end of the scale, some of our grizzled veterans, actually overpay their buyer's agents. And I think it's almost out of some weird guilty or otherwise screwed up thought process because the grizzled veteran says, well, gosh, I wouldn't work with a buyer for any less than blah, 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 right? They overpay. And I always reel them in and I say, look, how much of the transaction is that buyer's agent actually doing? If their job is to pre-qualify at some level and convert the lead, but most of that, certainly the lead was generated by the team leader, which may or may not have been paid for. So you're already out of pocket, Okay, so then their job is to show property, get them in contract, lather, rinse, repeat, right? So, you know, if you're only doing maybe 20% of the transaction tops, why do you pay your buyer's agents, some of you guys, 65, 75% of the transaction, if you take off whatever you paid for that lead potentially, right? So what are you ending up with? You might actually be losing money. Does that make sense? It does. You know, it's very interesting that you said that because that is a huge problem because, you know, it's also about the ego of the buyer's agent and the uh, the fact that the person that's running the team as you as it is doesn't really have the knowledge to know the fact that they aren't making profit. So the buyer's agent stomps in their office and says, I'm not going to work for 50-50. And then the, you know, the, the, whatever you want to call them, their label, the person that's running the team, it basically kowtows to that pressure and says, okay, well, I'll pay you 60%. You know, that whole mindset, brokers have been plagued with that problem forever. You know, it just the best word sometimes in situations are, is simply no. And like that, you just simply tell them, listen, the fact is, is that, as Julie just said, if you think about a real estate transaction, there's three big, you know, there's three big chunks of it, right? There's the, the, the acquisition of the lead, the converting of the lead. Then there's once the lead is, you know, working with, uh, basically committed to working with you. And then there's the actual doing of the work, the showing of the houses and negotiating the contract. Once it's all in contract, then there's the closing of the contract, the, the, the processing of it, the negotiating those aspects or conditions. So if you look at it, as Julie just explained, in three big pieces, at the end of the day, the most that any of you should be paying buyer's agents is only 35%, if that. That's a bottom. That's just a. That's, that's almost a hard overpaid thing. if you look at it uh, uh, in terms of what they're actually doing for the money. It's almost overpaid, and a smart buyer's agent who gets that will look at the look at the best part of that, right? So, what are the expenses that the buyer's agent has? Their cell phone and gas for their car. That's basically it. So, if they get into the zone of lather, rinse, repeat, a great buyer's agent will actually make more net profit than the team leader does, which also is kind yep. of crazy to think about, because yep. they, they're not out of pocket anything. They're not sharing it. They're not splicing and dicing in a million different ways. So that's the mindset of a great buyer's agent, realizes that making 25 or 35% of the transaction with no expenses and no transaction coordination obligations and no lead generation obligations They'll actually make and keep more money by doing more transactions when they can just lather, rinse, repeat, and keep on getting buyers in contract time and time again. The wrong buyer's agent mindset is, well, I won't do it for anything less than this, and I want an extra giant fee when I refer you a listing, and that kind of attitude, that's not a buyer's agent attitude. There are great buyer's agents in the world, but they have to get what they're actually doing and where their place on the team actually is financially. So like you said, Tim, it's okay to say no and then move on to the next person who probably is a better choice. Okay, so, yeah, absolutely. That, yeah, and that opens up a similar thought process. So remember, we're talking about profits here. So how do you pay your transaction coordinator? Again, some agents are overpaying or oversharing that side of the deal because they can't themselves understand why somebody would ever want to be a transaction coordinator. Just because you can't see yourself doing it and you wouldn't do transaction coordination for 350 bucks a file doesn't mean there aren't great transaction coordinators who are happy to do that and do it at a very high level. In fact, a better job than you probably do yourself. 
but don't put your own ego and criteria on that. Just because it's a job you don't want to do doesn't mean there aren't people who are great at it making a reasonable wage so that you can then actually have some profit. So next thing, Tim, I, have, I pulled some quotes out of the book, and then we're going to close the call in a little bit about more about what to do about the points from this book as a profitable real estate professional. So here's some quick quotes. He said in the book, again, George Clotier is the author, money talks. Show who's the boss by paying yourself first. Some of you aren't paying yourselves as if you're running the show. Some of you are like you know, ending up being $15 an hour employees of yourself when you actually look at the net. And some of you are actually losing money because you're spending too much on paid lead generation. So the next quote was, there's no money in, quote, team, just mediocrity and excuses. So Tim, can you talk a little bit about this phenomenon that we see sometimes on teams where people sort of hide out on the team and then they blame the team leader for not being profitable? Well, right. It's buyer's age. Well, we are, we're, we're harping too much on buyer's agents, but it's a great way to make it a point, right? So a lot of folks will not want personal accountability. They'll avoid it like the plague. Um, they will seek out uh, work environments where they can essentially hide, and the, you know, basically the accountability of accomplishing a specific goal is spread amongst many people so that the, ne- the attention never goes back to what they did or didn't do. In your, those of you who have brokerages, those of you who have teams, those of you who are hiding, uh, considering you know, building a staff, um, you've got to be really, really freaking careful in how you go about um, setting up your, your internal culture. Because if you set up this internal culture, of, which is very, again, common in the real estate industry, that we're a team, one for all, all for one type of thing, well, that sounds great on paper, and it certainly is reinforced by a lot of the pop, uh, popular culture myths about what it takes to be a successful business person. But the reality of it is when you're building a small business, which all of you guys are, and let's say a small business is anything less than, say, $20 million a year in revenue, not sales, revenue. So, you know, $20 million in commission or $20 million in sales would equal 600000 in revenue. So I'm talking about $20 million in revenue. Just be clear about that. When you're building a business like that, if you allow teams to sort of be the – the way of the day, you're going to be constantly battling with complacency, constantly battling with who's in charge, constantly battling with lack of personal accountability. So look at your existing staff or look at your existing business structure and ask yourself, how do you know if that individual person is actually pulling their weight? And if it's a team and if they're, you know, here's a, a fun test that you can do. Ask the folks that work for you if they'd prefer a team goal or an individual goal. Anybody that says team goal, you should immediately be suspicious of for the reasons I just talked about. The true rock stars in your midst, assuming you have any, hopefully you do, they're not going to want team goals. They're going to want individual goals. They don't want the slow, complacent people that are team loving to be holding them back. They want to be able to spread their wings. They want to be able to prove what they've got. They want to be able to earn their own money. They don't want their fate tied to whether someone else does or doesn't do their work. When you get a few of those folks working for you, you there are really no limits to where you can go. And the way to manage people like that, by the way, is, is frankly, uh, you kind of set a big goal for them and you give them the room to actually pursue it. The bigger the goal for people that have the mindset of personal achievement, the better. And the more, frankly, they'll do for you in terms of being loyal and appreciative of the fact that you didn't try to hamper their Uh, earning potential. So think about that. Teams in a business environment, for the most part, are a bad idea. There is no personal accountability. There's no way you can individually manage somebody that's on a team. And the other thing is, is when you have these little teams, you also have a situation where they all cover for each other. There's never, it's just sort of what happens is the bar doesn't get raised. It gets lowered in a team. Conceptually, I'd say even go as far as to say common sense tells you that what I'm saying is true. You guys all know this. Most of you listening right now, maybe on one page, on one hand, you think, well, it'd be nice to be in a team because it's sort of this, you know, hypothetically, it's sort of this protective environment. But as an individual uh, practitioner, knowing now what you know about the types of people that are going to be in a team, wouldn't you be better off if you could be in, if we're, if working for someone, wouldn't you much rather be uh, allowed to flourish as an individual opposed to, again, be put with a big group of people that maybe and most likely don't have the same level of as, as ambition as you do? I mean, these are all 
I think in many ways, stressful thoughts for folks. Because again, we're all told that when you run a business, when you have a business, it's your job as the business owner to essentially be mother hen over everyone that looks for you, works for you. It's your job to essentially treat your business as almost like a little social, a socialistic society where everyone basically is pulling together. It's almost like this. That's not really how business works, guys. That's not really how healthy, profitable businesses work. Now, if you want to run a nonprofit, if you want to essentially create an environment where everybody basically earns uh, a really good living and you only earn a, a moderate living, then go ahead and do the whole team thing and, and have at it. Just know that what you're sacrificing is profit. I say this quite often on our radio show, and it's a great quote, and this is something that um, people that are loving being part of teams hate. They don't like this quote. It's a Ronald Reagan quote. So, you know, it's trust but verify. So you can trust when you delegate, that's great, but you always need to make sure that it's being done. In teams, it's almost impossible because of all the reasons that we just discussed. So, Julie, what's the next point? Perfect. So I'm going to fast forward because we're going to eventually run out of time here to what to do about the points and the quotes that we've been discussing and about the thoughts that are being created by these points. So to just sort of put a period at the end of the sentence and give them some specific homework, because a, you know, a lot of times you go to seminars, you listen to radio shows, and it's like, okay, that was great, but what am I supposed to do about it? So that's the section we're in now. So point number one, have a business plan that includes specifics. What are your financial goals? Sometimes, Tim, we ask agents about, you know, what's your plan? They, they say things like, well, I want to earn 25% more this year. Well, is that a number? What is that based on? So have a business plan. What you must earn monthly to pay your personal overhead, business overhead, taxes, pay your debt off, and most importantly, build up your reserves, not to mention some fun money. If you don't have money set aside for fun, you won't be having any. So actually have a business plan. If there's no business plan, there's really no reason to expect that your business will be profitable because you're just a hobbyist at that point if you're not using a plan. So point number two is related to that. Know how much you actually have to earn to actually be profitable. And Tim, that's kind of a come to Jesus session with some, you know, figuring out what profitability actually is. What is that number? Because so many agents think whatever's left over at the end will be my profit. So can you talk a little bit about those conversations you've had with coaching clients where you actually figure out What's it take to actually be profitable? How do you define what that even means? Well, again, to what Julie was just saying, you start out with what your it's, – it's a fun conversation, really, that one, mm -hmm. because you have to ask what their expectation is. Once they accept the fact that the whole point of them being in business and taking the risk and having the lifestyle of being a small business owner, then, you know, that's one thing they never tell you when you're getting your real estate license, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sure. not normal working hours, you're right? I mean, even any kind of business owner that's the same mindset, you don't just work normal hours. You have this constant, what would you, almost like this uh, software going in your head that's constantly monitoring and thinking, and it's almost like this antivirus software, right? Isn't that what being a small business owner is? It doesn't stop. It, you know, it just constantly goes on. In some cases, you dream about it. So there is a cost. There's a psychological and sometimes physical cost that goes with being a small business owner, that people don't really, I think in many cases, um, pay themselves for, right? So you're not just working a nine to five. You're not just like a staff member waiting around for a transaction to be processed or a buyer lead to be closed. You are thinking constantly about all the potential risks and you need to be compensated for that. So really, the first thing that we would do as creating your financial plan, this is part of the real estate treasure map, is you need to go in and do a real be honest about your personal expenses, okay? That's the first thing. What does it really cost to run you, you, your family, per month, per day? So then we determine what your daily expenses are, and that is what we call your daily burn rate. Kind of an eye-opener for many people. Then we do the same thing for the business expenses. And here's the funny thing about the business expenses. The business expense, in many cases, especially those of you who are coming to us that have these big staffs that are selling hundreds of houses per year, you guys will defend your business expenses until the cows come home, and you will fight tooth and nail. But when you're going and deciding to buy yourself a new car, and you could hypothetically afford a new Mercedes, but you rationalize buying a Honda because you want to continue doing this marketing thing in your business because maybe it's going to create more transactions. Isn't that funny? So you'd rather personally sacrifice in an overt way. When you're going on vacation, you accept 
going on a, uh, a cruise. Cruises are great, but what you really wanted to do is take your family to France for two weeks. You get the point? So you guys sacrifice on the personal side to pay for expenses on the business side that oftentimes, when you look at them objectively, are impossible to rationalize. The websites, the the lead, the paid lead generation. Again, some of your staffing issues are just crazy. Um, your leases, oftentimes, and your pro- all these different little things we go through, and we almost do like a forensic analysis of really what is truly working to make you money. Where does your profit truly come from? By the way, um, I have never gone through this experience with anybody and had the answer not been the same. Okay. The profit almost always comes from the listings. And if you're not doing listings, if you're essentially as a, as a practitioner, if you're selling, say, 100 or 200 homes per year, and you go down, you go through this analysis, again, you're willing to actually open your mind to the possibility of running a truly profitable business, and you look at where all the expenses are going, you look at the money you're spending to support this, to support that, and then you look to where, you're, where any sort of paycheck for you comes from, it comes from the sale of the listings. So then the question that we always ask you is, okay, well, what if you were to shift essentially all your energies and focus just in the listings? And then we go through the process of maybe uh, pivoting your business towards a truly profitable business. And then you then oftentimes we find that people will shed the things that they were doing before just simply because they weren't producing profit at all or not the profit margins that they need for them to produce to accomplish their goals. Guys, you have got to have a financial goal that is designed around you producing eventually enough passive income, usually from rental properties, it's our favorite certainly, that someday, hopefully sooner than you think, you'll have options not to work. Now, I'm not saying, because I know some of you are saying, dude, what would I do if I wasn't working? I get that, right? But it's totally different. Waking up in the morning, having to work to pay the bills, having to stress out because you don't have enough money saved, having to stress out because all the usual financial reasons that plague most people versus waking up in the morning and not having to work. In other words, all your financial worries are behind you. You've slayed that dragon. You are, in essence, financially so well off that if you decided to take a week off, you would be just fine. Nothing would, no harm would come your way. No, nothing would get repossessed. Uh, nobody would go unfed, right? And here's the interesting thing that happens. When you actually evolve to the point where you are, in essence, financially independent, and in many cases, it takes a lot less money than you guys think. I mean, if you really, really were to take a seriously hard look at all these types of things that we'll do with you um, when you request a free coaching call at freecoachingcallsforagents.com, when you really do take a hard look at all these things, it becomes super transparent what you need to be doing to accomplish the goal of, again, having that sense of financial independence. You know, it's fun. When we do live events, Julie and I always ask, like, well, why did you get in this business? And they'll always in the usual answers. And then you ask the question like two or three times, and then one person in the audience will always say, freedom. That's yeah. the answer. You got in this That's business for, to be free, not having to worry about all the stressful things that keep you up. You guys realize that that worry lifestyle is optional. You don't have to live that way if you don't if you don't choose to any longer. But it does require a major pivot in your thinking. And again, unfortunately, virtually every single piece of advice you're getting from anywhere, any book you read, certainly a lot of the coaches out there are telling you stuff to do to to grow your business, to do more transactions, to create more revenue, but they don't talk about profit. Do they? That's the reason you're listening to us right now. Nobody tells you how to make more profit. They only tell you how to, you know, create more transactions, do more volume, essentially, you know, turn a lot more. Yeah, exactly. Not make more profit. So the mindset of profit means that everything changes. The conversation doesn't end with what's left is my profit. The conversation begins with, I am going to pull 20%, 30%, 50% profit out of my business and then the decisions that you make about how to go about doing it come after that, not the other way around. Guys, it, when, we're, when you're listening to this, what we're saying to you, doesn't it just feel like the type of advice you would have gotten from like, your grandparents? You know, Good old-fashioned common sense? Mm-hmm. Well, what happened along the road that a lot of real estate folks you know, didn't, they just forgot about that. They forgot about the fact that they're in business to make themselves wealthy, to make them, their, their families wealthy, to create generational wealth. 
you know, guys, wrap your mind around the fact that there's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with having a lot of it. There's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, building sound businesses that have folks that work for you that make a lot of money. But you've got to take care of yourself first. You've got to build your business around profit. Any closing thoughts, Jules? Well, yeah, I have this very specific memory of going to a seminar when we were fairly early in our careers. And I can't remember who said this to me, but it, it really stuck with me. And we were talking about you know, how agents say what we're on track to make when you're at one of those seminars. Mm-hmm. And I, I wish I could remember who it was. I'm sure it was one of the Howard Brinton stars at the time. And they said, the question you should be asking is not what you're on track to make. It's what are you keeping? And I remember having that thought, gosh, I wonder why nobody ever talks about that. And at the time, you know, we were like two years in the business or something, and it, it didn't stay with me. That's one of those, it's too soon to tell how you're going to use that thought until maybe this very radio show when we're sharing this with our listeners. But really, that's, that's something they really should teach you, like day one in real estate school. Well, and but I'm Julie, sorry Julie, that they you don't, the- but that's why we're here. Go ahead. Well, since you brought that up, let's just, let's just you know, these guys kind of, you know, a lot of our longtime listeners, certainly our coaching students, they know why. And, you know, this isn't something we normally would say publicly, but here it is. It's because our industry basically uh, doesn't really take care of agents. Our industry is assuming that you guys are fungible, that you guys are going to come and go. And you know what? Statistically, that's a fact. Something like 90% of all the agents are out of the business within four years. So there's no point in teaching you guys profitability. But it's not just a sickness in our industry. It goes all the way back to the way we're educated. The way we're educated nowadays is what? You will someday retire. You will have your Social Security. You'll have, in other words, we're led to believe that there'll be some extraneous third party, you know, big brother type thing taking care of us. None of those things are true. They're all lies. You know what? You know it too. So stop believing it and stop, stop uh, allowing yourself to suffer through, you know, this goes back to another radio show, this poverty mindset and, and don't allow yourself to believe that you can't be financially free. You can. Why else would you put yourself through the 24 7 stress? of being a business owner. Guys, if you, uh, you have something in you, you, there are some weirdness oddity in you that made you want to get into the real estate industry, that made you want to take this risk, that makes you want to do this on a regular basis, and you want to be financially free. And to a person listening to us right now and in replay, every single one of you at your core got into this business because you wanted to have that sense of freedom. You remember that now, don't you? What are you doing about it? Have you noticed that it's starting to slip? Have you also noticed that it's not reinforced inside the golden halls of real estate? No. Nobody's teaching agents this. We are. So you guys need to really seriously accept the fact that it's you that is ultimately in control of your own financial destiny. And if you aren't taking control of that and you're relying on somebody else to watch out for you, it will never happen. Um, There's lots of statistics on this about the number of people that basically get to retirement age, whatever that is nowadays, that are either dependent on a family member or the government. In other words, they're stone cold broke. It's something like 90% or more of folks work their entire lives, get to the point where they're in their golden years, whatever again that is, I'm not sure where all this stuff means, but at the end of the day, it's when they're older and to the point where they don't want to work as, in a full-time capacity anymore. In most cases, virtually every single American is broke, either dependent on a family member or the government. How about that for your big payoff after working your whole career? So if you don't build profit into what you're doing, with every single thought, at every single moment in your business, you won't have any. And with that profit, because you don't have any, you won't have an opportunity to build wealth. Think about these things, guys. Take responsibility for them. Great book. Definitely want to get it. It's also on Audible, which is I listen to virtually all my books. I don't read them. Profits aren't everything. They're the only thing. If there's anything we can be doing for you, please request a free coaching call at freecoachingcallsforagents.com, and we'll talk with you on the radio tomorrow. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris.